You remember he gave himself that B plus for his first year in office? Yeah. T tell that to the four million Americans who lost their jobs last year. President Obama's self-proclaimed B plus will go down in history as the biggest exaggeration since Al Gore's invention of the internet. Okay, perhaps a little dated humor, but nonetheless, Mitt Romney had the crowd in the palm of his hands at CPAC. I miss Mitt Romney's jokes. Top line starts right now. Hello and welcome to ABCNews.com's Top Line. I'm David Chalian. And I'm Rick Klein. Each weekday we're bringing you the very latest political headlines, reporting, insight, analysis, everything you need and want to know about politics. And today's a day for apologies, so we apologize for not talking about Tiger. Instead, we're talking politics. As always, it's at the note, twitter.com slash the note. Let us know what you think. It doesn't count if you mention his name. Then doesn't? you're talking oh, about it. All right, right. I, missed, I, I missed out. Get us I started. What is your top line? Cattle call. 2012ers are making the rounds at a conservative political action conference right now in Washington. Tim Pawlenty, the latest. Mike Pence also there today in Mitt Romney's heels, as we saw from yesterday. Uh, plenty of room for laugh lines. We know they've got the comic writers out there, and you can deliver the one-liners. But the bigger issue that we have to talk about with all of this is, is what do they do with this energy, this enthusiasm, to channel it into something? some kind of productive movement for Republicans. Uh, listen, this gathering is a specific one. It's these young conservative activists. I have to say, I love covering it every year only because it's one of those rare opportunities where you really see young people engage in politics. Uh, we saw a lot of that in the 2008 campaign, but it is good to see that that newer energy come into the process. But you're right. That's the challenge for both parties all year long here about, about how to motivate their folks. Ellsworth's in. Yes, Brad Ellsworth, that uh, moderate conservative Democrat that Rahm Emanuel uh, got a uh, elected to the House in 2006, one of his big recruits back then, is now going to run for Evan Bayh's Senate seat, he says. Uh, here, here's the problem, of course. By choosing to get into the Senate race, they've basically handed now another House seat over to the Republicans, uh, who are starting to rack up the numbers uh, and maybe moving into sort of the 30s now of seats they really can win. And as you know, they need 40 to take the majority. And this is really why Evan Bayh's timing put him in such a tough spot. They couldn't get any ducks in a row here. Ellsworth is a pretty strong recruit and I think he's going to be a strong statewide candidate because of his conservative leanings, his uh, sh background as a sheriff. But it does leave a big hole in the, in, the, in the House lineup. Republicans are happy about the person they've got there. And by no means a guaranteed win for the Democrats in the Hoosier state. Definitely, you know, definitely the, not. In the Senate race. Vegas diss. President Obama is in Nevada today. And one of the subtexts, so those, those lines that he has delivered at, in part of his stump speech, kind of off-the-cuff lines about how you can't go and blow all your money in Vegas. The problem is Vegas likes you to blow all your money in Vegas. And Harry Reid also wants you to blow at least some of your money in Vegas. This has actually gotten some coverage out in, in Nevada, and it's something I, I think a lot of people are looking for President Obama to be addressing today because people are blaming that, including the mayor of Las Vegas, Oscar Goodman, are saying it has had an impact on tourism. I don't know if it's true or not. It's hard to imagine that people are taking President Obama's advice and not gambling or not going to Vegas, but uh, this is just something that's going to continue to dog him anytime he talks Nevada. And uh, he will play along, I'm, I'm sure we'll see, and, and Harry Reid has taken to the Senate floor. He's sitting and talked about this. The larger political story there, of course, is the incredibly embattled majority leader that uh, Barack Obama is trying to prop, prop up. Neither one of them actually all that, prob all that popular in Nevada right now. Finally, govs gather. Yes, here in the nation's capital, the 50 uh, state governors from around the country will gather for the National Governors Association meeting. And Rick, the thing to pay attention to when these governors gather is the health care debate, because I think they have the ability to have an impact on this, especially heading into this bipartisan meeting at Blair House. They don't attack that health care issue, as you know, in, in the partisan terms we covered here in Washington. They really see it as uh, that health care is trying to, this health care reform is going to break the backs of their budgets. Uh, it really is on the states, and it's their cost both Republican and Democratic governors fear. That's just it. It cuts across party lines. And I think some of the some of the the appearances for the cameras coming out of this are going to be important heading into that meeting next week. How do Democratic governors in particular handle this? I'm going to add a quick fifth top line just because I see it uh, breaking now on the AP that uh, U.S. Senator Frank Lautenberg, Democrat of New, of New Jersey, 86 years old, has stomach cancer. No uh, word yet on his intentions about filling out the rest of his term, but obviously um, we wish him well in his recovery politically. There is now a new Republican governor, Chris Christie, in the state of New Jersey, and should Lautenberg step down, he would have the ability to uh, appoint and the news, uh, a replacement the news for Democrats continues. Uh, unbelievable. We begin with uh, Congressman Darrell Issa, a Republican of California. He joins us up on Capitol Hill. Congressman Issa, thank you for being here. You addressed uh, CPAC, the conservative gathering this morning, and you sort of ga gave a briefing, if you will, to the folks there on the 2010 uh, landscape, how things are looking for you, you House Republicans. What, what did you explain there at CPAC? 
Well, I did two things. First of all, I did talk to him about the sort of good news on what's going to happen in the upcoming election. But I also talked to them about the investment that they had to make in making sure we don't mess it up again. That as conservatives, we have to realize that President Bush delivered tax cuts. He didn't deliver restraint in government. And that when the Democrats, quite frankly, bash us over that, they have a point, which is that it, without reigning in government, tax cuts are not a solution. And this, this administration has made a lot of hay. Well, in fact, they're heading us toward tax increases unless we make a, an about face as soon as we take control. How different is the mood uh, ba compared to a year ago uh, with the same gathering came in Washington and uh, obviously it was an Obama era with the expanded majority. So what, is there a bounce in everyone's step these days? It's bigger, it's younger, and it's positive. And those are the three changes that I see. It's not old and angry. It's young, excited, and looking forward. The questions I'm being asked are questions about how do we invest in the economy for the future. President Obama has talked about the green economy. He's talked about a lot of things. These people really want to know how they're going to have the kind of jobs their parents and grandparents had, good paying domestic jobs. And in fact, clearly as manufacturing jobs have gone away, how we're going to reverse that trend here in the United States. Congressman Ice, I want to turn your attention uh, to the topic of uh, Toyota. Uh, you've been uh, very involved uh, with your committee work up in the House in looking at the Toyota issue, the recalls that have been there. And we learned that Akio Toyota, the, the chairman, was going to refuse uh, to testify before Congress about this and then turned 180 degrees, now announces he's going to come and testify before the committee you serve on. What happened there? How do you, how'd you guys get him to turn around? Well, I think I resonate on Japanese television. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the Japanese television stations have come to my district. They've, they've gotten me both here and there, wherever I am. They're interested, and they see that, in fact, the Lee Iacocca of Japan is going to be, have to be Akio Toyota, not because the company's products are bad, but because the most important thing they had, which was quality and safety, is now in question. He needs to change it to, we will change, we've done wrong, we'll do it right, and only he can do it. And an underling was not going to accomplish that. And I believe, quite candidly, the open television that was going on in Japan caused him to realize that the Japanese needed him to do that on their behalf rather than send an underling to a congressional inquiry that was not going to change the tone. Congressman, based on your review so far, what, are you satisfied that federal regulators and the federal government did everything they could have and should have to address the problems uh, as they emerged? Not at all. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the NHTSA, without an administrator and, and clearly not having made any changes over the last decade, decade and a half, is so far behind the power curve of gathering data in a modern age around the world, coalescing it and coming up with their own opinion, and then char charging the, the uh, companies to make a change, that what they end up doing is they end up running through a bunch of old paper and then saying we don't have the resources to pursue things further. Clearly, it's an, it's an agency that needs to do an about face. It's the reason that we're going to have Secretary LaHood before us. And we're going to talk about what is his vision for that agency becoming a global world agency able to see problems, for example, of the Prius in Canada and Japan, rather than wait until it bubbles up here in the United States. Looking back at the previous administration as well. Absolutely. The, there's, you can't say that President Bush did something wrong in his eight years. What you can say is nothing new and different and innovative and better happened during those eight years or during this last year. And, and a decade has gone by that it was wasted. We need to guarantee America's safety by leveraging the $86 billion that these companies spend in R&D more efficiently than we're doing it today. And we can. The, the ability to have safer cars rests to a great extent in government having better oversight. Congressman, very briefly, uh, do you think we saw the next uh, Republican nominee for president at CPAC this week? I don't think there's any question that you've, seen the, that you've seen or will see the next Republican nominee, but you're seeing an awful lot of people there. <laughs> <laughs> Congressman Darrell Issa, Republican of California, thank you very much for being here. You're most welcome.